Today we'll be reading in Psalms 139, so open your Bibles with me and we'll read from God's Word. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. And your right hand will lay hold of me. May the Lord prosper his word in our hearts. Heavenly Father, it is a true, amazing realization to know that you, the infinite God of all the created order, That you truly love us with a love that is everlasting. And that you have set love on us before time begun. Father, thank you that you have chosen us and ordained us to eternal life in this and eternity past. We are your chosen people. We are your royal priesthood. Your holy nation, a people for your own possession, as says the Apostle Peter. May we open our mouths to proclaim your excellency. Because you have, Father, delivered us out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. You raised us up out of spiritual death through the saving truth of your gospel. We now have the blessed privilege of being not only, Father, your servants and your slaves, but your sons and daughters. We say with the Apostle Paul, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Father, we ask that you would remove from our hearts All fear, all pride, evil desires, false motives, envy, worldly importance. Father, remove all of that from us. May we, Father, wait patiently on you. May we learn to see the wisdom of your providence even in the midst of the circumstances that we find ourselves today. May we, Father, learn to appreciate your wisdom in all that is going on. May we understand that in the end, your purposes will be fulfilled. Father, you are in control of all things. You know our rising up. You know when we lay down. You know everything about us. You are sovereign Lord of our lives, and of all creation. May we praise and bless your name this day for all that you are and all that you have done on our behalf in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Today is a day you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day 
you have made And I will rejoice and be glad in it And I won't worry about tomorrow I'm trusting in what you say Today is the day Today is the day I'm casting my cares aside I'm leaving my past behind in my heart and mind on you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good. Today's the day you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. I'm putting my fears aside. I'm leaving my doubts behind. Giving my hopes and dreams to you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good. Today's the day you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today's the day you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Cause I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. And I will stand upon your truth. All my days I live for you. All my days I live for you. And I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I live for you. All my days I live. Today is the day you have made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day. and be glad in it and I won't worry about tomorrow I'm giving you my fears and sorrows where you lead me I will follow I'm trusting in what you say today is the day today is the day today is the day He 
each and every one of you. Uh, on behalf of my family, my wife and Naomi and my family, we greet every family of our church. We love each and every one of you. We miss each and every one of you. But uh, we are thankful to the Lord that um, uh, we have been caring for one another and we hear the testimonies and we hear the reports that um, uh, we are caring for one another and just ministering to one another, praying with one another. And I know through our shepherding care groups, uh, there are prayers going on every week. We appreciate the Lord and our pastors of our church, uh, the deacons of our church. Greetings to them as well and to all their families. And we have also been praying for families that have been impacted by this, uh, by this virus that uh, some of our members have, have um, endured the loss of a family member. And so uh, we have prayed with them and um, Others have reached out and as best as we can under these circumstances. But let us continue to watch one for the other and pray for one another. Um, and if you are mindful, the giving that we continue to do, we do it through online. Um, others are mailing it to the church and that is perfectly fine. Uh, let us continue to be mindful that that is part of our worship and our ongoing ministry here at the church. For today, we are returning to Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. Jesus knew the future. Uh, I've decided that um, to go back to Mark, and I hope that you'll see the relevance of it, and that uh, somehow the Lord, through his Spirit, will make the relevance of this passage and the lessons of it to us during this time. So we are in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. Um, it says there they were... On the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were fearful and again he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him saying behold we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered to the chief priest and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. May the Lord bless and prosper his word in our hearts. Someone said that Mark Anthony, the Roman general, under Julius Caesar won the last civil war that destroyed the Roman Republic. And had he won rather that battle that Jesus would have come into manhood in a different society. A society administered by highly trained professional Egyptian bureaucrats rather than nervous Roman amateurs like Pontius Pilate. These bureaucrats, bureaucrats, that is, would have had a much better understanding of how Jerusalem politics worked. They may well have found some solution to the local concerns about the self-proclaimed Messiah that would not have required his crucifixion. They probably would have arranged to have Jesus moved to Alexandria where the sophisticated Hellenistic Jewish population there would have not been so scandalized by his ideas. So Jesus might have grown old gathering to himself a gathering attracted by his social religious message rather than by a dynamic martyrdom. In such scenario, Christianity would have developed quite differently. So they say, is it possible to imagine Jesus growing old, attracting people by his message than by his 
martyrdom. I guess it depends on who you think that Jesus was. So many books come out every year about Jesus. Who was Jesus? Many think he was a prophet. Others, he was a god. The Jews, an errant rabbi. It appears everyone has their own idea and an angle of Jesus Christ. For many others, especially in our Western culture, Jesus is associated with something good. Many will see Jesus as an inclusive guy, a loving guy, a prophet of love. For others, he was a fighter. For the sick, he's the healer. For the poor, he's the provider. For the businessman, he's the ultimate executive. A popular Christian writer says that Jesus was sent by God with these good news. God loves humanity, says this writer, even in its lostness and sin. God graciously invites everyone from their current path and follow a new way. Trust me, says this writer, and become my disciple, and you will be transformed. You will participate in the transformation of the world, which is possible beginning right now. This is the good news, says this writer. The question is, is this really good news? Is Jesus really the object of our human imagination? Is he, is his identity really in the eyes of those who observe him? Who was, who is Jesus? Was he simply human? Who was tragically cut in the prime of his years? Maybe that is what many of you listening to me today think of Jesus Christ. The interesting thing is that Jesus is not any of those conclusions that people make of him when compared to the description that is given to us in the Holy Scriptures. It is important for you to know that Jesus, who knew his future was not an imaginary Jesus, or a mythological Jesus, or the Jesus of the speculations of people's minds. He was indeed a historical person. And at the same time, he was God in the flesh. And the truth is that Jesus' message cannot be divorced from his death. The message of Christ cannot be disconnected from his death. Today's passage is sobering as it presents to us what Jesus knew about his future. And the fact is that what he knew of his future, which was his suffering and his death, was very much his ultimate and masterful work. In other words, of all that Jesus did and all that Jesus said, no work was greater than his death. His resurrection proved that the work of his death was an absolute success in the eyes of God the Father. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead, it is proof that he has satisfied the demands of the righteousness of God the Father. The death of Christ is essential to his message The fundamental of the Christian faith is not about some teaching of Christ, about what we should do, but rather it is about what God has done. What God has done in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. The Bible does not present a Jesus to be simply respected, but rather a Jesus who has to be worshipped and adored, and praised, acknowledged as God incarnate. Jesus' ideas were not vague. They were not conventional. 
but rather they were specific and many times even shocking to his very own disciples. One of the things that validate the gospel of Jesus is that he was, it was presented clear and straightforward. Yet Jesus' disciples could not understand it. That is something that validates the gospel. The fact that though it was straightforward and simply presented, the disciples could not understand it. If this Jesus thing was made, wouldn't you think that Jesus would have chosen better qualified people, people of prominence, people of education, people with rank, people with riches, people with leadership, people that would project a better sense of confidence in others so that our trust in him would have been reinforced. You would think that Jesus would have picked people like that. But, the, but instead the gospel presents the disciples in all of their ignorance and misunderstanding of what Jesus was saying because it was so far out from what they expected. They expected Jesus to become king and to conquer Rome and to come and establish his kingdoms. They had doubts in how Jesus was now presenting himself. They were having a hard time. So when we look at Mark chapter 10, verse 32 through 34, as we read, there's a couple things that we'll see there about Jesus. Number one, that he is a teacher. He was a great teacher. The passage does not make the case on its face value, but we see it in the example that he gives. After all, this is what many people think of him, that he was a good teacher. So with any of our friends listening today, we have found some common ground with respect to Jesus Christ. He was a teacher and a good one at that. And I believe that we can all agree on that. Verse 32, it says they were on their road going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was set on high on a mountain, about 3,000 feet high. This is the first time in this section that Jerusalem is mentioned. Jerusalem from earlier in Mark's gospel was really the center of hostilities coming against Jesus. The Pharisees and the scribes have been monitoring his movements. They were monitoring with suspicion his messianic claims. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, these religious leaders had been spies to check up on him. Now Jesus is walking directly to Jer Jer Jerusalem, signaling that his entry to the city has finally arrived. The time has come. With this, the story of the passion of the Christ now begins. Yes, I know we've come through the passion of the Christ a couple weeks ago and we've been through Resurrection Sunday. But this is the passage we find ourselves in the book of Mark. And I believe there are important things that we need to hear in this passage for us today. We can never grow weary of the story of Christ. Jesus taught us how we are to teach each other. He taught, he taught others by example. If you read verse 32 again, you would notice that it says that Jesus was leading the way. He had been teaching that he knew what he was going to do. So Jesus is teaching them that he knew what he was going to do. In Mark chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus promised persecutions to his followers. But now Jesus is leading the way even to the persecutions he has just predicted. He's not being dragged like a prisoner to his condemnation. Jesus is predicting what will happen to him. He is predicting that he will be persecuted. Jesus is here teaching how to be resolved in the face of opposition, in the face of hostilities. 
Every step he is taking as he leads his disciples into Jerusalem is affirming his acceptance to his lot and fate to take place in Jerusalem. He is not vacillating nor second-guessing. He is moving forward in the face of impending suffering and even death. He was the teacher leading his followers like a shepherd leading his sheep. He was alone, and though they walked behind him and near him, none of them understood what he was walking into as he himself understood it. Jesus was leading the way into the very mouth of the lions. He understood. He knew the future. He knew what was going to happen. Mark chapter 8, verse 31, when he begins expressing what's going to happen, he says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Notice in verse 31 of chapter 8 of Mark, he says, he began to teach them. So he was their teacher and a good teacher. He knew all of this and he was resolved to obey the will of God. And he was resolved to obey the will of God completely. Jesus has given us a lesson of what it is to be resolved to obey God and his will and to do so completely. In this moment, he is leading the way and teaching how it is one faces suffering and death. He is teaching us and his followers and all Christians how we can face ordeal in our lives. How we can face persecution and even the ultimate price of death. The gospel of Mark is written at a time when Peter is in prison in Rome and there was rampant persecution against Christians at that time in Rome. Can you imagine how encouraged Christians in Rome would have been in hearing the teaching of Jesus, who is leading the way to his suffering. Jesus is not backing down. The example of Jesus is not one filled with fear and one refusing to accept the suffering. Jesus is moving forward, and he is setting the example for all who would follow him to also follow him in his footsteps. He was resolute as he walked towards Jerusalem, leading the way, showing how it is done. In 1 Peter, out of all people, right? Peter, chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his footsteps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So we see that Jesus gave us an example of what it is to endure suffering within the scope of the will of God. He also teaches his disciples by repeating things. We are reminded by the story that we ought to follow Jesus even when we are afraid and scared. Jesus repeats over and over the things that will befall him. It was not the first they had heard the message he gives them here. They had heard it before. The message of his death and what it means to follow is recorded at least three times in this Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. We just read that passage. He was teaching them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. What is their response? It says there that Peter rebuked him. Then in Mark chapter 9, verse 31, there we read, we read the Son of Man is to be 
delivered into the hands of man, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. The last time they rebuked him, he rebuked them back, and they backed off. This time now they're afraid to challenge him. They understand what he meant for Peter to have rebuked the Lord the first time around. They understood. But they didn't understand it at all, really. Their expectation about the Messiah being the conqueror was most likely what drove their reactions. It is what explains their misunderstandings. But Jesus knew they needed the lesson so badly. He knew how they did not understand. They were getting from Jesus the opposite of what they were expecting to hear. However, Jesus was serving them by teaching them again and again and again. It also gives us the lesson of Jesus Christ in his patience and love for his disciples. We too as a church, we find ourselves repeating teachings and the gospel in our church services. And the truth is we are forgetful people. So we hear the gospel in our songs we hear, it in our, we hear it in our prayers. We hear it in our preachings, in our sermons, in our counseling, in our discipleships. Ours is a message that is worth pondering on and rehearsing to one another on and on and on. It is worth dwelling on the message of Christ. Peter says in his second letter, chapter 1, verse 12, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. Someone says, the truth is always needing repetition because believers forget so easily. Jesus also teaches his disciples by warning them. He is not sharing this message with the disciples to discourage them, but rather to encourage them. It sounds like bad news, but actually when Jesus is sharing what he knows about the future is to encourage them. They may not see it now. They may not understand it now, but eventually they will, and they will be encouraged. So why sharing this message with the disciples would encourage them? He had to tell them by warning them in order to prepare them. To be forewarned, someone says, is to be forearmed. He wanted them to have their expectations set in the right place. So that when the death sentence verdict was given, although the disciples will be shocked at that reality, yet at the same time, they are to remember Jesus had warned them of that they would have remembered Jesus said these things to us when they would see that things were happening to Jesus as they did they would have been reminded that Jesus had warned them ahead of time so that every blow of the enemy against Christ because he has predicted it also becomes a reinforcement to the disciples who are hearing it. Every blow of the enemy against Jesus, because he had prophesied and predicted all of this, it all became a reinforcement for the disciples who had heard it. He is the one who knew this. He is the one who told them the truth about this. He is the one who is even now being condemned. He prepared his disciples by warning them. 
Many of us are inclined to read the nice and encouraging passages of Scripture. We like to go to those passages that are uplifting and encouraging and sound positive. Especially like in times as the one we are now all living in. And that is okay. But I want to also encourage you to read all of the Bible. Get all of the counsel of God. Read the nice verses. And the verses that are not so nice. Because even in his warnings, Jesus is showing us his love and kindness. As hard and difficult it is to digest what Jesus is warning the disciples. There we are seeing that he is showing them love and kindness. Believe what God has to say about sin. Believe what God has to say about trials. Believe what God has to say about suffering. If it's in the word of God, believe it. That is part of our life in this world. Fantasy will not help us to grow at all. They won't even help you and help us survive. They might be good for a moment, but they are not real and cannot sustain the soul. We must read the whole counsel of God. We must read the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. All verses, all passages. And Jesus made time to disciple and teach the few that were close to Him. In verse 32, and He again took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. He takes the time to disciple them. This might be slow and boring in some ways, but the end result is and will be glorious when we take time to help others, to lead others, to disciple others, to pour ourselves into others' lives. As Jesus was pouring himself on these men, he was preparing them to bless people from all over the world, from every tribe and nation and tongue. And we are enjoying that even ourselves now. Jesus selected and invested on those 12 as he did. And here we and many more find ourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1, the principle of Paul as well. Be eight imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says to Timothy, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Let us learn from Jesus. Let us learn from Paul. Let us pour ourselves into the lives of others. Even in times as these, these are not times to simply seclude ourselves and to confine ourselves to ourselves, but we should be about others in our lives. Even if it's a few, it doesn't have to be everybody, but a few. And the many will be blessed eventually. And so if Jesus is a great teacher, what have you learned from him? What have I learned from him? What have we learned from Jesus, the great teacher? Many will say he was a great teacher, but they have never read anything he said, and they have never read anything he taught. Many say he was a great teacher, but have never read anything Jesus has said. I encourage you to read the Gospels. Learn from Jesus. Believe me, your life will change for the better as your soul will be revolutionized. So in this passage, we are seeing Jesus as a teacher in how he lived and taught, but it was not how he taught that was important, but what he taught. Because that Jesus not only was as good and great a teacher, but he was also the Son of God. Verses 33 and 34, he knew the future. All of the predictions of Jesus were fulfilled completely and precisely as he foretold. He was a teacher, 
but he was also the son of God. He made predictions that were fulfilled totally, precisely as he declared them to be. Jesus' predictions of the future shows him to be a true prophet and certainly to be the son of God. He foretold of hell for those who would not forsake their sins. Jesus foretold of thrones for his disciples that they're going to sit in 12 thrones to judge all the tribes of Israel. But in our passage today, he foretells the near future. And notice how he is doing this. He does not say, the word of the Lord came to me. He does not say that I've heard a voice or that I've had some visions. Jesus over and over showed he had access to the future as you and I might ponder to the left or to the right. In that manner, Jesus knew the future because he is omniscient. He is the Son of God. He taught about the future with ease and preciseness. And you look at the ministry of Jesus and you find he knew the future and what was not accessible to the human eye. There was a time where he knew where a certain fish was swimming in the water with a certain cone coin in his mouth. Jesus knew how many times a Samaritan woman had been married and that the man that she was now with was not her husband. He knew that even though he had never met that woman. He knew a colt would be tied. And what the owners would ask the disciples when they tried to untie it. He knew when and to what extent Jerusalem and its temple would be destroyed. Jesus knew that the gospel would advance through the coming centuries. In today's passage, the Lord Jesus speaks with clarity and details about what is about to happen. He spoke simply and he spoke directly. He knows. He knows the future with such preciseness and accuracy. Look at verse 33. He does not say maybe or perhaps... Jesus is informing and instructing with clarity and with authority. This was no ordinary man here. This is the Son of God. The Old Testament prophets spoke with precision. And that was a testament to the Lord God himself. In Isaiah chapter 42 verse 9 we read. Now I declare new things, says God. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Verse 33 and 34 of today's passage of Mark chapter 10. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him and three days later he will rise. The ruling body of Jerusalem, of Israel. In Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court Jesus had said before they would reject him. And all of that prediction came to be true. The chief priest in verse 64 of Mark chapter 14, they all condemned him to be deserving of death. This word condemned used by Jesus implies that a formal decision of a body would be made against him. In verse 33, he would hand him over, he uh, will hand him over to the Gentiles. And in chapter 14, we read that he was condemned as Jesus has said. And when we look further, we read he was handed over to the Gentiles. In Mark chapter 15, verse 1, early in the morning, the chief priest uh, with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate, to the Romans, to the Gentiles. It all happened as Jesus said it would happen. 
The Jewish leadership and the Roman leadership would join forces and conspire against Jesus. The mention of the Gentiles is new. Jesus is not mentioned before. He is making things clear as the day of his death is approaching. Crucifixion was implied. Both Jews and Gentiles had their part in condemning the only completely innocent men ever to stand before any judge in the history of this world. Jesus was condemned by both Gentiles and Jews. So much for the justice we may expect from this world. We can and should do our part to see that things are done right. Many judges and lawyers attempt to do their best in rendering justice. But don't expect justice to be perfect in this world. Even the most innocent men did not receive justice. And if Jesus was condemned, we can never entrust our hope to any earthly court for all the good that we may do or may be involved in. God bless those judges and lawyers who attempt to do their best to deliver justice. Jesus, however, entrusted himself to him who judges righteously, and we should too. Jesus gives more as the Son of God, and knowing the future gives more details in verse 34. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three, day later, three days later he will rise again. The reality was starting to burn in him. It is understood that Peter is the one relaying these details to, the, to, to Mark who is writing this gospel. We can only imagine how these things burn in the mind of Peter as he too remembers denying Jesus. All of this came true. In Mark 15, 20 we read, they mocked him. In Mark 15, 15 we read, they scourged him. In Mark 14 and Mark 15 we read that Jesus was spat upon both by the Jewish leaders and by the Romans. They did kill him as Jesus had predicted in verse 34. Although Mark does not tell us that Jesus foretold the manner of his death, the parallel account by Matthew tells us that he was killed by crucifixion. Crucifixion is implied by Mark. Given that Jesus would not be delivered over to the Gentiles. Or rather, he was delivered to them. That is crucifixion implied. Mark 15, 24. And they crucified him. It came to fruition. It was fulfilled. It all happened as Jesus had detailed it. He knows the future because he planned it. He is sovereign over the future. In whatever situation we find ourselves today, let us be reminded that Jesus Christ knows our future. Since he predicted what would happen would help people know that Jesus had the right and the ability to interpret what would happen, to give the meaning of it. So when Jesus is putting forth all that is going to happen to him, he is making sure that everybody understands that in the end, it is going to be he who interprets what's going to happen and why it happens. He's telling his disciples what is to happen so that they will realize that he is the one determining. Therefore, he had a purpose for it. And he is the one who could explain it. There was no accidents. This was no tragic accident on its own. These were acts as tragic and as outrageous as they were. They were according to God's purposes. They worked out our salvation. Praise be to God. Peter's prayer in Acts chapter 4 verse 27 and 28 shows us the purpose of all that happened to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, verse 27, there we read, uh, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both, you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Everyone, God is sovereign over every 
aspect of your life. All of the details of your life, including all of the twisted things, they are not as complicated. They are not as difficult to God as the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And yet God is even sovereign, even now, as He is as good a God now as He was back then. Your employment, your life, your family, your future, it is all under the control of God. We can trust Him with the future of those we love so much, and especially in times as uncertain as these. We can trust Him with our own future. It has been said that believers' fears about the future stem from our wills differing from God's will. We must bring our wills to align with the will of God for us. And how do we face the future? Instead of fear, we must face it with faith. And how can you face your future with faith? Grow in your understanding of God. God can be trusted. Hasn't God shown you his kindness over and over and over? He will be faithful to you in the future. He is a good God. He is a good teacher. He is the Son of God. And he's also our Savior. He came to die to be our Savior. This is at the core of this passage. The suffering of Christ predicts, predicted shows how costly and how amazing God's love for us is. In verse 33, we read this title, Son of Man. When he talks about himself fulfilling prophecy, he does so in the third person. We have a short summary of the sufferings of Christ in verses 33 through 34. Not all of them are there listed. Other things that Jesus did not mention here happened to him, like the false witnesses or the denial of Peter or even the dividing of his clothes. But Jesus here sees clearly and sets before them the expectation of the reception that they were going to have when they arrived there in Jerusalem. He wanted them to know how it really was going to be. Everything as he has stated in these verses will take place. He will be delivered to the chief priests and to the Gentiles. He will be mocked, spat upon, scourged, and he will be killed. In the passage parallel to this in the Gospel of Luke, we read that Jesus taught them everything written of him by the prophets. Luke chapter 18, verse 31, then he took the twelve aside. This is the par parallel text of this story in Luke. And he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. This includes the purpose for his sufferings, as we find in the Old Testament passages. Psalms 2, we read the rage of his enemies against him. He probably would have touched on some of these or all of these with his disciples when he took him aside. Zechariah 13, he would be betrayed by his friends. Zechariah 11, he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Numbers 21, the serpent lifted up in the wilderness, a picture of the Son of Man lifted up on the cross. Psalms 34, none of his bones would be broken. Psalms 22, his clothes would be gambled, and so on, and so on. Then Isaiah 53, the greatest of all messianic prophecies. The servant substitute, the servant sacrifice, who provides redemption for sinners, who is wounded for their transgressions, bruised for their iniquities. Isaiah says that he suffered for our peace for our healing, for our justification. Jesus is telling his disciples that the author of their lives will now become the author of their salvation. He came to be our Savior. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to, be, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The night before his crucifixion, he speaks of his blood that is to be poured out for many. You understand why he died? Romans 3.25 says, he, God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. That was the sacrifice of atonement. Everyone knows Jesus died, but the question is, do you know why he died? It is not enough 
It's not as important to know that he died. But why did he die? That's more important. Why he died is at the core of his teaching. It is central to what it means to be his follower, to be a Christian. The core of the Lord's Supper that we celebrate is the proclamation of his death until he returns. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This all means that Christ's foreknowledge shown in his predictions explains the actions that he is taking in these last weeks and days. There is no accidental death. There is no surprise sufferings. These are those, there are even those scholars who will suggest that something went terribly wrong in the life of Jesus. But Jesus' whole teaching proves that is not the case at all. He took our place for the love he had for us. Jesus knew what he was walking into. He was not taken by surprise. He took on the shame and the pain of our sins. He took on the pain of God's punishment for our sins. It was his Father's will and his too, as we read in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. He knew his time had come to suffer at the hands of sinners and to experience the wrath of God at the cross. But then he would return to God the Father, a victor, a conqueror. He showed his own for the full extent of his love by the extent of his sufferings. The extent of his sufferings show the majesty of his love. In John chapter 13 and verse 1, there we read, He loved them to the end. He loved them to the max. He died so that we might be saved. The purpose of his sufferings was our salvation. Jesus dying for us was an act of love. What is your greatest fear? The Bible says... Your greatest fear should be God. Because God is good and we are not. Because God, he is so good. And because he is so good, he will punish us. Everyone will have to give an account to God. If you think there is no God, you are gambling your eternity on the hopes that there is no God. And you, God will hold accountable. You're probably more afraid of the virus that's going on than you are of God. And Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him, that is God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I want to remind you there is a God who's going to judge everyone, but he has made a way for us to be forgiven. Christ on the cross bore the penalty that we were due for our sins. All of us. He calls you even now. We are now forgiven in Christ. Trust in him alone to be in right standing with God. The disciples were amazed. They are amazed because there is something of Jesus that they are seeing. He is leading the way towards Jerusalem. They knew that that was going to be problems for him. Even Thomas says in one of the other Gospels, let us go together and die with him. They knew the challenges that were ahead. So they were amazed at the determination most likely they see in Jesus. He is not walking behind them as someone who is hiding in fear. He is walking ahead of them, leading the way to Jerusalem. And others... It says they were afraid. When the disciples, they were amazed, there were others afraid. But then, not only is he our teacher, the Son of God, but he's also the risen Lord. He is also the risen Lord. He is teacher, he is the Son of God, he is our Savior, and he is the risen Lord. Three days later, we will rise again. He is not dead. He is our risen Lord. Jesus predicted, and as you read all the Gospels, it happened as he said. 
If Christ had not risen from the dead, we would have never heard about Jesus at all. Had he had not risen, we would have never ever heard of him at all. But because he rose again, that is why we hear of him, have heard of him, and worship him every Sunday. Because Sunday for us, every Sunday is Easter Sunday. You cannot ignore this. Consider the joy of the resurrection so that you will be able to bear the cross he calls you to carry. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him, there was going to be a joy after the suffering. Life is difficult to live without the joy of the anticipated resurrection. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Only a fool would deny Jesus Christ. There is a soldier at the cross, a centurion, who stated, truly, this man was the Son of God. Repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let us pray. Father, we are amazed at such love. Lord, we acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge that we only deserve your judgment and wrath. You are rightly king and you have given us everything and you have given us life and blessing upon blessing in this life. And yet, we have used all for ourselves. We deserve your eternal judgment. And yet, in love, you extended the grace to us in Jesus Christ, your son. We thank you for rescuing us from that, what we had become. Thank you for rescuing us from our rebellion. Thank you for rescuing us from what we had made ourselves to be. Thank you for rescuing us from ourselves. Father, help us to love Jesus Christ all the more for the love we see him displaying. Remind us of how personal his love was, that having loved his own, he loved them to the end. I pray for anyone at the reach of my voice today who does not know Jesus Christ. Lord, may this be the day when they will put their head down and they will bow down and repent of their sins and believe the testimony of your word. Believe in Jesus Christ. Confess him as Lord and God. Help them cry out for their forgiveness and receive them by your grace. For you to have mercy on them. Help them see their rebellion against you. We pray that you would accomplish this for your glory in the name of the one who sacrificed it all for us in his Blessed and glorious name we pray. Amen and amen. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. Knees of Calvary. For you, the perfect Holy One, crossed your son. You drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. In Jesus, thank you. The Father's right complete satisfied Jesus thank you once your enemy and now seated at your table Jesus thank you by your perfect sacrifice I've been brought near Your kindness. 